The psalmist says, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord, and we rejoice that he has given us grace and strength to heed the admonition, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Not all are so uh, privileged or able, but uh, God in his grace has enabled us to come together as the people of God, and we rejoice that we may do so a second time this Lord's Day to give him the worship and praise that is due him. We welcome also those who are unable to come, by, uh, who join us by radio and the internet, and pray that this service may be a rich blessing to you at home. Our call to worship is taken from oh, one announcement before our call to worship. We uh, rejoice with uh, Michael and Rachel Van Mersbergen in the birth of a daughter this morning, Rosalind Mary, uh, who weighed in at seven pounds, four ounces. So a baby daughter, and uh, congratulations to the parents and grandparents and uh, aunts and uncles and uh, the family in the birth of a healthy baby girl. Our call to worship is from Psalm 65, the first four verses. Praise is awaiting you, O God in Zion, and to you vows shall be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our sins, you will provide atonement for them. Blessed is the man whom you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do confess with the psalmist that that man, that woman or child is blessed who is able to approach you as we are able to approach you this evening, as we are able to come into your heavenly sanctuary through the power of the Spirit to worship you in your holy temple. There we give you praise and honor and glory. Here we fulfill our vows, because you are the God who hears prayer and answers us. You are the God who provides atonement for our sins and wipes away all our transgressions. We thank you and praise you, Father, for your love to us in Jesus Christ, and pray that our worship may be to your praise and honor and glory this evening. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let us praise God by singing from Psalm 65, from which our call to worship is taken. We'll sing 65C. And we'll sing three stanzas, the first three stanzas, standing if you're able.
congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us join together and confess with our faith the words of the Apostles, using the words of the Apostles' Creed found on the inside front cover of the Trinity Psalter hymnal, saying together, I believe in God Almighty, of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The very day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. To lead us in the worship of God this evening, I want to read to you Psalm 102, found on page 689 in the Pew Bible, Psalm 100. This is a cry for help from a person in great distress being trampled down by his enemy. But he's not only concerned for himself, he wants God to show mercy to Zion and to make, uh, as he says in the last verse of the psalm, make all God's servants and their descendants safe and secure forever. He has no doubt that God will rescue his people. He says in verse 13, you will, you will arise and have pity on Zion. He speaks of a time that God has set for that and that time will come. He's confident in God because God is a powerful God, the creator God, he's an eternal God, and above all, he is a merciful God. He wants his prayer recorded so that when the the help does come, people will see that his prayer has been answered and they'll give praise and glory to God. This prayer uh, speaks about being cut off in the middle of one's days and that, that makes me think of Hezekiah. This could have been Hezekiah's prayer because he used that when he uh, turned his face to the wall and wept that he was about to be cut off in the middle of his days. Uh, God heard Hezekiah's prayer and uh, gave him new life, uh, gave him healing, and gave him uh, many more years. This certainly is the, the prayer of Israel, of the northern tribes that were carried into captivity by Assyria and uh, the southern tribes that were carried into captivity by Babylon. Uh, they were severely oppressed by the enemy, and God heard their prayers and rescued them in due time, brought them back from many lands, and they came back to Jerusalem and rebuilt Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple. Uh, this is the prayer of Jesus Christ who was uh, beaten down by his enemies and his temple was destroyed, but in three days he raised that temple, his body, up again. And uh, this can be our prayer as uh, we uh, share in the sufferings of Christ and uh, this is especially the prayer of the, the persecuted church who are suffering from uh, the enemies of the faith who mock us and who seek to snuff out all vestiges of uh, true religion from public life. Uh, but we know too that 
he will have mercy on us. Uh, he will have uh, mercy on Zion. Christ will return. He will raise us up. He will renew the earth and establish an eternal kingdom of righteousness and peace in which all God's people and their descendants shall be safe and secure forever and ever. With that in mind, let us uh, look at the words of Psalm 102 entitled, A Prayer of the Afflicted When He is Overwhelmed and Pours Out His Complaint Before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call at me speedily, for my days are consumed like smoke and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones to my skin, I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and am like a sparrow alone on the housetop. My enemies reproach me all day long. All those who deride me swear an oath against me, for I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping because of your indignation and your wrath. For you have lifted me up and cast me away. My days are like a shadow that lengthens, and I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, shall endure forever, and the remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and have Zion, for the time to favor her, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. For the nations shall fear the name of the Lord, and all those of the earth your glory. For the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. This will be written for the generation to come, that a people created may praise the Lord. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary, from heaven the Lord viewed the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those appointed to death, to declare the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. He weakened my strength in the way, he shortened my days. I said, O oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, all of them will grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. The children of your servants will continue and their descendants will be established before you. As far as the reading of God's word, let's sing that same psalm as we find it in selection number 102. We'll sing the four stanzas, all four stanzas remaining seated.
us come now to God in congregational prayer. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts before you on this, the Lord's Day, the day of resurrection and new life. We come before you as a needy people. We come and pray with the psalmist that you would hear, you would hear our prayer, that our cry would come before you. Do not hide your face from us in the day of our distress. Incline your ear to us. Answer us speedily in the day when we call, for our days pass away like smoke, our bones burn like a furnace, our heart is struck down like grass and has withered. We forget to eat our bread because of our loud groaning, our bones cling to our flesh. We are like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. We lie awake. We are like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. All the day our enemies taunt us. Those who deride us use our name for a curse, for we eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with our drink because of your indignation and anger, for you have taken us up and thrown us down. Our days are like an evening shadow. We wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come, for your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. Nations will fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For you, Lord, build up Zion. You appear in your glory. You regard the prayer of the destitute and do not despise their prayer. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise you, Lord, that you look down from your holy height from heaven you looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and in Jerusalem your praise, when peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship you, Lord. You have broken our strength in mid-course. You have shortened our days. O our God, we say, take us not away in the midst of our days. You whose years endure throughout all generations, of old you laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you forever. Father, we thank you for the assurance that indeed, though we are persecuted and despised by the world, uh, Christ is coming and he will raise us up and uh, crown us with glory. We thank you that uh, the resurrection has already begun with the resurrection of Jesus Christ and through union with Christ we are being renewed inwardly day by day, being conformed more and more to his image in knowledge and true righteousness and holiness. We thank you, Father, for your many mercies upon us. We thank you for your covenant promises to be a God to us and to our children after us. And we pray for Rosalind Mary, born this morning to uh, Micah and Rachel. We rejoice with them, Father, in a healthy, well-born daughter and pray that you would bless this family, bless our family, the family of God in this place, that we may rejoice and be glad and that uh, we may see your hand of mercy at work in this young child's life, in all the lives of our children that they may grow healthy and strong in body and spirit and become bright and shining stars in your church and kingdom. We thank you, Father, for uh, health and strength and uh, for the opportunity to go about day to day and do the work that you have given us to do. We pray, O oh Father, that you would give us strength to serve you in uh, whatever way you have called us to serve. We pray, Father, for the elderly who have uh, diminished uh, abilities and who are struggling with uh, a weakness of the flesh in various ways. O oh, Father, help us to be patient, to not lose heart, to not become discouraged, uh, but uh, to persevere in hope and in faith, knowing that in due time, as we humble ourselves under your mighty hand, you will lift us up and make all things new. We pray, O oh, Father, that you would bless the missionary outreach of the church. We thank you, Father, that uh, the whole Federation of Churches is praying today for uh, Reverend Landasari, we thank you, Father, for uh, the work in Quito, Ecuador, and uh, our partnership with him, and pray that you would continue to use uh, the Light of Life uh, Church 
to uh, reach out to many in uh, the city of Quito and also for a new church plant in the south part of the, the uh, city. We uh, pray, Father, that uh, this may proceed and uh, be blessed and used mightily to reach many new people. We uh, pray for the pastoral training program, again, that it will uh, train up men for the gospel ministry and be used to uh, equip the church uh, for uh, many years to come. We uh, thank you, Father, for uh, a, new, a renewed website and for uh, new elders and deacons and pray that you would continue to supply what is needed for this congregation. Oh, Father, we uh, pray that you would uh, be with us in the week that is ahead. Keep us from the power of the evil one. Enable us to uh, uh, live rejoicing in the knowledge that sins are forgiven through faith in Christ and to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice of thanksgiving in view of all your mercies to us. Bless us also as we bring our offering for mobility worldwide in uh, Blyton. We thank you for this uh, ministry that helps disabled people around the world. We thank you that uh, several of our members are able to volunteer their time and talent and energy for that work and uh, pray that uh, they may be encouraged by our prayers and gifts this evening. We ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let us continue to worship God in song, singing selection number 400, Gracious Spirit, Dwell in Me. We'll uh, stand if you're able and sing the four stanzas of number 400. Our scripture lesson this evening is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 7, page 1,345, 1,345 in the Pew Bible. Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 17 and reading through the end of the chapter. This I say, therefore, and testify... 
that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to licentiousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct and which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. Therefore, lying he speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is, has need. Let no corruption proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, God in Christ also forgave you. As far as the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it. In conjunction with it, I'd like to read to you from the Heidelberg Catechism, day 43 on page 893 in the Pew Bible, or in the um, Trinity Psalter hymnal, 893, Lord's Day 43, concerning the Ninth Commandment. What is God's will for you in the ninth commandment? That I never give false testimony against anyone. Twist no one's words, not gossip or slander, nor join in condemning anyone rashly or without a hearing. Rather, I should avoid, under penalty of God's wrath, every kind of lying and deceit as the very works of the devil. And in court and everywhere else, I should love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it. And I should do what I can to defend and advance neighbor's honor and reputation. Beloved of the Lord, we have been considering together the Ten Commandments, and the last several commandments, the Sixth Commandment, the Seventh, and the Eighth, are simply stated in the Scripture, uh, you shall not do this. You shall not... Uh, uh, murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. But this commandment comes with an additional statement. It's not just you shall not lie, but, or you shall not bear false witness, period, but you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. There is this emphasis on uh, the community in which we live and the need to speak truth to the community. It comes through in other passages as well. For example, in Leviticus 19.11, we read a couple of the commandments, uh, concluding with the ninth commandment, and it says, you shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another. If it were like the other commandments, it would simply say, you shall not lie, period. But it says, you shall not lie to one another. Uh, Colossians 3, verse 9, do not lie to one another. And again, from the text that we read in Ephesians 4, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth, period. No, not period. Let it speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We might wonder, why does God deal with truth-telling in the context of our relationship with those around us? Well, it's not because it's okay to lie to strangers. That's not the point. Uh, and that's not uh, uh, true at all. Uh, rather, it's because God is not just 
saving individuals and taking them to heaven to be with him. He's saving a new humanity who will all live together with him in a city that will fill the earth. God is building new community, and that community is to live together in love as family. Community is not possible without trust. Trust cannot exist in the context of lies. Think about husband and wife living together in love. One discovers that the other is lying, lying about something, and it may be only a little thing, but still lying. And all of a sudden, the whole relationship changes when, when one spouse discovers that the other one has been lying. It, it just changes everything. It, the, the foundations of the relationship are shaken like an earthquake, and, and you wonder whether the relationship can go on. Well, if that's true in, in a marriage, it's also true in, in a family. And, and we are a family. We are a family. You know, sometimes the elders have trouble visiting members of the congregation, and uh, the report comes back, well, you know, uh, they, uh, they just are, are private people. They, uh, they keep to themselves. And, uh, and so uh, we just have to kind of respect that. Well, there may be good reasons why uh, people are shy and uh, retiring, but we can't just ignore one another and, and close our lives to one another. We are brothers and sisters in Christ called to live together as a family, as a community, and in order for that community to thrive, we need truth. We need to speak the truth to one another. We must not lie to one another, for we are members one of another. So this is a very important commandment for the life of the church, for the life of God's people. And as we deal with this commandment, I want to uh, emphasize three things. And my outline that I submitted uh, two weeks ago to the bulletin has uh, undergone a a slight modification. Instead of two points, I have... uh, Three, uh, one is, uh, the first point is to warn you about the power of lies, then to encourage you by the fact that we have been redeemed from the power of the lie, and then thirdly, we have been called to live in community of the truth. First of all, I want to warn you concerning the power of lies, and the power of lies is a deadly power. Uh, It is uh, the power to put people to death. I started to talk about this a little bit this morning from John 8, 44, and as soon as I opened my mouth, I said, no, don't talk about that now, that, save that for tonight. And uh, I tried to quickly move on to something else, but uh, now I do want to emphasize John 8, uh, 44, where uh, Jesus says uh, concerning the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth. Notice how Jesus in one sentence talks about a murderer who has nothing to do with the truth. Those two things go together. Uh, because there, there is no truth in him, he says. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And the reason lying and, and murder go together is because Satan used a lie to bring death into the world. He lied to uh, Adam and Eve. He lied twice. Uh, first of all, he uh, lied about God when he said, uh, when he asked the question, did God say that you may not eat from any tree in the garden? You know, he's trying to make God a, a killjoy who doesn't allow people to have any fun, like uh, a father who takes his son into a toy store and lets the son look at the toys and then says, now you can't have any of them. Well, why did you take him into the toy store if you're not going to let him have any of them, you know? Uh, some people, Satan wants you to believe that God is like that, that, that God is, is a killjoy and that God doesn't wa- want you to have any fun, that you can't eat from any tree in the garden. Well, Satan knows full well that that's not what God said, but he, he wants to put that thought, that lying thought in the hearts of us so that we begin to doubt the goodness of God. And, and that's what happened in the beginning. And then, of course, he uh, outright contradicted God when he said, you will not die, and uh, that was a lie also. And because Adam and Eve believed the lies of Satan, they sinned, and because they sinned, 
The penalty of sin was implemented. Death came into the world. Death has come through uh, the lies of Satan. Satan used them to bring about our death. He's a murderer and he murders through lies. Jezebel put Naboth to death by the power of lies. And Satan continues to spread lies designed to, to bring about your death and the death of many others. Think about the lie that, that uh, a, uh, a human being in the womb is just a mass of tissue. Not a baby, not a human being, but the world says it's just a mass of tissue and it's no great deal to get rid of that mass of tissue. Well, that lie has killed millions upon millions of unborn babies. The uh, uh, television and movies and videos have been uh, portraying for years all kinds of lies to get you to accept sin as normal. Uh, In the uh, early 60s and 70s, there were situation comedies on television that uh, showed uh, children rebelling against their parents and uh, every act of rebellion was uh, followed by a laugh line where uh, it was a joke and uh, the children ruled the roosts and fathers were made to look like nincompoops and, and uh, preachers were made to look like hypocrites in every uh, Hollywood uh, production. Uh, recently, World Magazine, a, a Christian news magazine, did a movie review on three new movies, horror movies, that uh, Netflix has put out and has warned people, don't watch them. They're bad movies. And uh, the movie has a a familiar theme. There's good and there's evil, and goodness uh, overcomes evil by the power of love. Doesn't sound so bad until you look at the details and find out that uh, the, the evil in the film is Christianity, particularly uh, Puritan uh, New England Christianity is the evil. And uh, Satan is depicted as someone good. And the love that conquers evil is uh, the distorted sexual love of a lesbian couple. Uh, So, you know, everything is backwards. Uh, That which is evil is called good, and that which is called good is evil. And that's the way it's been going in in our society, in, in entertainment media, all kinds of things like divorce and uh, uh, rebellion and, and everything. They, they're constantly being depicted as, as good and normal and, and something that we shouldn't be afraid of. Well, Satan's lies are resulting in a lot of death uh, because of that. It's destroying lives. Uh, and, of course, Satan tries to get you and me to lie, and he is often successful. How many of us haven't uh, made a mistake? Maybe you made a mistake at work, and uh, you didn't want the boss to know about it, and so you uh, tried to uh, cover it up so that it wouldn't be found out, or you uh, uh, maybe uh, said something that you were ashamed of and were confronted with it and said, no, no, I didn't, uh, I didn't say that, uh, when you know full well that you You did say that. Well, God hates lies, and he punishes liars. Ahab and Jezebel came to a bloody end because of their lies. Ananias and Sapphira, who lied to the apostles and lied to to God and to the Holy Spirit, were met with swift justice. And uh, apart from the grace of God, we too all would uh, be put to death for our lives, our lives. But God has redeemed us from the power of lies. Jesus came under the power of Satan's lives when he, uh, uh, many false witnesses testified against him at his trial. He was put to death because of those lies, but he didn't stay dead. The power of Satan's lies could not hold him in the grave. He rose victoriously over death and over the lies that killed him. By his death and resurrection, he has saved you from your lies. He paid for your lies, all your word twisting, all your little white lies, which are neither little nor white in God's eyes. And he gives his spirit so that 
the same power that raised him from the dead now lives in you and enables you to break free from the power of lies in your life. When he comes again, he will vindicate you before the world and all the world's lies about Christians will be shown to be false and we will be seen as the true children of God. Because he has saved us from the power of lies, we are called to uh, live new lives, to live lives of, uh, uh, of truth, to live in a community of truth. Now, lying takes many forms. The commandment says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the particular focus of that commandment is giving testimony in a court of law where justice is dependent upon uh, at least two witnesses coming forth to confirm that they are eyewitnesses of the crime in question and uh, have uh, uh, first-hand knowledge of the event and the guilt of the one who has been accused. If you, uh, in, under Mosaic law, if a person gives false testimony in a court of law, in a trial, in an investigation, uh, before the elders of the community or whatever, then uh, the punishment that would have fallen on the accused had he truly been guilty is to uh, be given to uh, the, the person who lies because uh, you're trying to, to bring something on someone that they don't deserve and because you do that when you lie in, in under testimony, under oath, uh, the punishment should fall on you if uh, you are discovered to have told that lie. But uh, it uh, is not uh, limited to testimony in a court of law as uh, the apostle says uh, therefore putting away lying each one speak truth to his neighbor we are members of one another he's describing our life together in the church we're all to uh, encourage one another by speaking the truth in love saying that which is for the edification and building others up not uh, everything that is true is uh, needs to be said uh, there are lots of things that, uh, that are true that ought to be forgotten because they have been forgiven and ought not to be brought up again. Uh, bringing up uh, someone's past sins about which they have repented and so forth is uh, destroying their reputation. And uh, the catechism reminds us that we, are, we should do what we can to advance, defend and advance my neighbor's honor and reputation. And if he is a repentant sinner and, and has repented of uh, certain sins, then don't bring them up anymore. Uh, advance his good name as a, a repentant sinner and uh, show forth uh, the good that he is doing. Uh, one of the ways in which we often violate this commandment is uh, assuming we know why people do things when we really don't know. Uh, and uh, Someone uh, fails at a certain duty, say the duty of uh, coming to church. You know, the, the elders call you to church. And we have promised when we made profession of faith to, to heed the elders. And so we're under obligation. We've given a vow that, that we'll listen to the elders. So they call us to come to a worship service. We're supposed to come. And, and then people don't show up. And we say, oh, isn't it a shame? They, these people, they must not be true Christians. You know, we just, we assume that because they don't show up, they must not be true Christians. Well, it could be that, you know, they're flat on their back with so much pain that they can't get out of bed. And uh, if you would only take the time to call them and say, we missed you. Uh, how are you doing? Is, uh, is there a problem? You'd find out the truth and and then you'd be equipped to pray for them and for their healing so that they can be up and about again and be able to, to come to church. Or uh, maybe they're not in church because they're in church uh, in another state uh, far away because they're visiting family or they're on vacation and whatnot. And you don't know that, but you don't see them, and so you assume the worst. Well, assuming the worst is sinning against your brother and sister in Christ. We are under obligation before God to always assume the best, always assume the best that, uh, about people. And uh, if you're going to imagine something, don't imagine something bad, imagine something good, but better yet, uh, 
speak to one another and uh, find out what's going on in one another's lives. Uh, you would do it if it was your children. You would do it if it was your brother and sister. Well, we are all brothers and sisters and fathers and children uh, and in the family of God, and therefore we belong to one another. We are members one of another, and therefore we ought to easily communicate with each other and not assume the worst, but instead assume the best. Uh, we must always uh, speak up in defense of uh, people when they are slandered. You know, when uh, uh, the apostles on Pentecost, the first Pentecost, began uh, speaking in other tongues, the, uh, the crowd thought, oh, they're drunk. You know, they've been, they've been drinking and they're, they're incoherent and that's why uh, they're acting the way they are. And uh, Peter got up and defended their honor and said, it's only the ninth hour. These people aren't drinking, but this is, this is what Joel the prophet spoke about. This is the outpouring of the Spirit and so forth. And he, he defended their honor when King Saul uh, missed David at a, a feast day. He assumed that David was in rebellion against him, but Saul's son Jonathan said, no, 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 that's not the case. And and, and Jonathan spoke up in defense of his friend David. He defended his honor. And so we too, if a fellow Christian is maligned or uh, uh, spoken ill of, we need to come to their defense. Uh, there was a school teacher uh, in an eastern uh, school district recently who uh, came under great criticism for not using the pronouns that a student wanted to uh, have used with respect uh, to himself or herself. Uh, they wanted uh, maybe plural pronouns or pronouns of a gender different than the gender with which they were born. And the, the Christian teacher couldn't bring himself to use these inappropriate pronouns. And uh, he was called before the uh, school board and there was a, a big uh, meeting and a big hubbub. And that teacher's church uh, members and pastors showed up in force at that meeting and, and, and rallied behind him and stood with him and defended his honor as uh, a good man and a, 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 an upright man, a righteous and a holy man. And, and it was a, a wonderful thing to, to see and to behold. Uh, I heard a news report about it. I didn't see it uh, firsthand, but I heard a news report it uh, through uh, World News. And uh, it, it was very encouraging to see how a church would come together around one of its members that was being maligned and uh, spoken ill of in the community, but uh, who didn't deserve that. So we too need to uh, come to one another's defense. Uh, well, what if you're slandered? What if somebody slanders you? What should you do? Well, there the, the situation is a little different. We, we all ought to come to our brother and sister's defense, but with regard to ourselves, uh, the Bible tells us that we should entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, we're told that when Jesus was reviled, he opened not his mouth and Peter tells us he was giving us an example of how we ought to respond when we are reviled. Uh, let, it, uh, let it fall on you and uh, let others come to your defense. Uh, we ought to pray that when we are viciously maligned, when you or I are viciously maligned, that pray to God that God would use that for our sanctification. There's an example of that in the scriptures when David, King David, was fleeing his son Absalom, uh, a man of the tribe of Benjamin named Shimei uh, came alongside David, a little bit distant, so he didn't want to get too close, but he threw uh, uh, rocks and dirt at David and then cursed David, uh, blaming David for the demise of Saul's family, something which David was totally innocent of. David had, had a couple of opportunities where he could have killed Saul and, and both times he spared Saul's life. And, and when he discovered that a man had actually uh, murdered Saul, he ordered that that man be put to death for murdering King Saul. He was one who had defended Saul's life and who 
grievously mourned the death of Saul and Jonathan, his friend. Uh, but Shimei blamed David for that. And uh, David didn't defend himself. And he even stopped others from defending him because he, he wanted uh, to be humbled on that occasion. He knew that, that the rebellion in his own house was the result of his sin and and therefore, he uh, was praying that uh, this would uh, humble him and sanctify him and make him a more godly person. And, and uh, God allows us to go through experiences like that for our sanctification. And therefore, we too must learn to bless those who curse us and pray for those who despitefully use us and, and let a clear conscience enable you to make sanctified use of false accusations. Well, this is what God wants of us, to, to speak the truth to one another, to uh, uh, defend one another's honor, uh, to uh, not defend our own honor, but humble ourselves uh, under God's uh, uh, mighty hand, because we know in due time we will be vindicated uh, uh, any lies that are said about you will be shown to be lies on the judgment day. If they aren't set right now uh, by those who come to your defense, God will set them right on the judgment day. In the epistle of James, in James chapter 3, verse 2, it teaches that our ability to control our tongues is a measure of our whole sanctification. You know, if you... You want to know how sanctified are you? Uh, don't look at your church attendance. Don't look at how uh, uh, joyfully you sing the, the psalms and the hymns in church. Uh, don't look at uh, whether you uh, read the Bible every day or pray every day. But all of those are measures of your sanctification, to be sure. But the real measure where the rubber meets the road is, is whether you can control your tongue whether you uh, get some juicy bit of gossip and just can't wait to, to tell it to somebody so that that person looks bad because when they look bad, you look better. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's the, the joy of gossip is that uh, uh, we can condemn others and in condemning others make ourselves look better and instead of uh, attempting to advance our neighbor's good name and, and humble ourselves before others. Uh, the use of your tongue, that is the measure of your sanctification. Well, how are you doing? Well, uh, I don't think any of us are doing as well as we ought to do. In fact, we fall short often. But Christ died to pay for our misuse of the tongue, for your misuse, for my misuse. Christ died to pay for that. And he gives us his spirit to enable us to live lives that uh, speak the truth. So let us pray that we may be indeed people of the truth and be the pillar and foundation of the truth, that this church and all our sister churches may indeed be the pillar and foundation of the truth by proclaiming the truth and by being a community of truth that does not lie to one another. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this commandment, this commandment that is hard, hard to obey. Indeed, we have fallen short of the mark so often. But we thank you for Jesus Christ who has redeemed us from the deadly power of lies. And we thank you that by his strength we can learn more and more to speak the truth to our neighbor and build one another up in love. We pray, O oh Father, that we may be such a family in Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us respond to God's word by singing together selection number uh, 196 from the blue Psalter hymnal, from the blue Psalter hymnal. We sang Psalm 101 from the uh, red Psalter hymnal last week and the second selection, I thought the tune was a little too hard. So we're gonna sing from the blue Psalter hymnal 196 of mercy and of justice, my thankful song shall be. Standing if you're able, all the stanzas. <laughs>
We worship God now with our gifts and tithes and offering. The offering is for mobility worldwide in uh, Leighton, and after which we'll sing uh, uh, number 544, Lead On, O King Eternal.
receive now God's parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord the countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>